Today's video is brought to you by StoryboardThat.com. Please visit TeacherCast.net slash StoryboardThat for a limited time offer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to TeacherCast podcast number 108. Today, we are talking all about online education, specifically high school online education. Thank you so much for joining us. I have a few great guests today. Today, we're actually on the show going to be talking to Will Lenson from the Canadian Online High School. But before we get to that interview, I want to talk to you about some of the great stuff that's going on. And to do so, I brought with me my friend and my co-host from the Tech Educator podcast, Sam Patterson. Sam? How have you been, man? I'm doing great, Jeff. Enjoying the first uh, few weeks of school here at the beginning of the year and really excited about all of the great stuff that we're getting going in my brick and mortar class. While at the same time, I've been taking classes to become a certified online instructor, so I can't wait to hear about the challenges and opportunities in online high school. Definitely stick around if you're out there watching or listening. We have a great interview here all about the online high school stuff. But Sam, I wanted to get back. You know, the summer's over. You had some great experience this week, and a lot of that stuff has to do with Waka. How is Waka, and what are some of those things that you're doing this year with Waka? I saw some great video. Um, you were working with him on first and second graders, right? Definitely. Um, I continue to have fun with Waka. He's a great puppet. He's always willing to help me out. And he's really useful two times per each class. Right at the beginning, I'll use him to make an Intu video, and I posted a couple of those this week where Waka's introducing the concept we're doing. He's helping kids remember how we treat an iPad carefully. And then towards the end of class, as I want to bring their attention back from whatever they've been doing, whatever they've been learning, I've found that you know I can ask them to be quiet and pay attention to me as nicely as possible, but as soon as that puppet goes up in the air, their eyes are locked on him. They're waiting to hear what that puppet has to say. They certainly are magical little things, aren't they? Uh, the kids are the puppets. The puppets. Oh, yes, definitely. And puppets you, are magic. And, you know, occasionally we get information from our viewers that says, I want to learn about puppetry. And we did a wonderful presentation out at ISTE. And all about puppet making. And we did find out that puppets are very, very easy to make, even if you just have a simple um, cardboard cutout or a paper bag. What are some of those quick, quick, quick things that you can tell somebody as, as far as just how to make a puppet for somebody? Well, you know, the quickest way I can think of to make a puppet is to uh, take a paper bag and a Sharpie, and you can just kind of... Need more hands here. Draw some eyes on it and a little mouth, a little nose, and then suddenly you have a puppet. And basically, you know, a puppet can be made out of almost any inanimate object that you pour enough character into. I mean, I have a, a pomegranate here, and if I were to, for example, draw on this pomegranate and give it a couple of eyes. You know, that, that can actually start to look like something. And then if I give it a mouth, you know, that, that could really start to look something. And if I really wanted to do something, I could even uh, maybe give it a little hairdo. And then suddenly, we've got a character. Hey, guys, are you ready to learn about the magic of puppets? I am. And... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to eat this puppet later, but luckily I haven't put any ears on the puppet, so it doesn't know I just said that. And, you know, the great stuff that you're doing is a form of online learning. I mean, again, if you go to your YouTube channel, which is at the Edu Puppets Network, you are finding that, you know, you're creating some really nice online videos to help those first and second graders learn. But those videos don't have to take a lot of time, right? These are short, short things just to get the kids excited about various topics. 
Exactly. I try to keep my videos to maybe three or four minutes long tops. You know, if I can make the video in two, you know, two minutes long, that's great. I try not to make them take too long to create because then I'll run out of time to actually do it. If all of my tech pieces are working right, I can use my iPad to make a green screen video with a couple of puppets in about 15 minutes, and that's a three or four minute long video. And while the kids are watching this video in which I have a pirate setting the purpose for what we're going to do today, and then he introduces Waka, and Waka talks about the key concepts we're learning that day, the kids are engaged in that, and while they're doing that, I'm making sure that I have all of the iPads in the right place, in the right order, so when the video's over, iPads go in the kids' hands, and we're getting to work. You know, talking today about online education, coming up is our great interview with Will from the Canadian uh, Online High School. And there are several ways that people here can participate in TeacherCast online learning. Sam, did you know that TeacherCast offers a great channel called TeacherCast University? I did know that. I'm a big fan of TeacherCast University because it allows teachers to learn what they need to know to be successful in their classroom at their own pace. We have several great things. In fact, these are some of the new features of TeacherCast since we did our redesign this summertime. Of course, we have a brand new segment called Google Drive in under five where we're going to be going through step by step of how to use Google Drive. We're going to dive into Classroom, Google Docs, things like that. Short, short, short videos that are just going to dive into almost every single button that Google has to offer. And that, that sounds amazing, Jeff. You know, just today, the HR person from my school came up to me and she said, Sam, I saw you sent me this video about the Google. I need to know more about it. Can you show me? Did she really say the Google? Yeah, she really did. She said that I understand that I have to do all of the things on the Google now, but I don't really know what it is or even what to do. So can you come and be very patient with me and show me? And I plan on that. But I may also send her a bunch of TeacherCast University links because I think your website might be more patient than I am. The website is definitely patient. We have over 500 podcasts up on this thing and many, many more to come. We have a couple hundred videos and screencasts. If you haven't checked out TeacherCast.net, check it out today. Share it with your friends. There's, of course, many ways that you can reach us. You can find us on Twitter, at TeacherCast. And, you know, shows like this about online learning are really about you the listener and you can provide some great listener feedback at teachercast.net slash voicemail in fact we love it when you send us these voicemails online we, oftentimes we play them on our show um, also you can of course email us at feedback at teachercast.net and of course you can subscribe to this and all of our other shows such as the tech educator podcast and our teachercast app spotlight and many more over at teachercast.net slash itunes and teachercast.net slash YouTube. So we're going to flip over right now to an interview that we did with Will Lenson, one of the founders of the Canadian Online High School. My guest today is Will Lenson from the Canadian Online High School. Will, welcome to the show today. How are you? Very good, Jeff. And how are you doing out east? I'm doing really, really well. Also joining us today from the Tech Educator Podcast and the EduPuppets channel, Mr. Sam Patterson. Sam, how are things with you out in California? Things are great out in California. A little bit dry, so uh, I understand they've got some rain up in Canada. I'm hoping they can send some of that our way. <laughs> well, how are things up there? Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us what is the, Can the, the, the Canada Online High School? Well, um, we are located in Guelph. Uh, the Canadian Online High School started with a brain uh, idea that, uh, that a friend of mine had, and uh, my particular background uh, is 38, 39 years of education. I forget the count now, but I retired back in 2006 as an administrator, having dealt with everything from head of guidance to cooperative education consultant to administrator, elementary and secondary. But when I retired, I uh, decided to do a little bit of dabbling in real estate. But uh, two years after that, a friend of mine uh, said, Will, how, how, what do you think about doing a Canadian online high school? Actually, we didn't even have the name at the time. He said, online high school. And I said, sure, what do you need me as? He said, qualified principal. He said, uh, I'll handle the tech side. You handle the administration, uh, school board end, if you will, um, and pro policy and protocol. And I'll take care of the staff and some of the curriculum, and maybe we'll make it work. And it, we had our first inspection by the Ministry of Education back in um, November of 2012, and we've been going ever since. 
So when you're looking to build something like this, what type of a platform do you start with? Is this, uh, how, how do you go about creating an entire online universe for, for, you know, for, to base learning off of? Well, the first thing we had to look at was uh, what was compliant with the ministry. Uh, we looked at a number of um, online um, platforms that were out there. We looked at some that the universities were using. We looked at universities in Europe, uh, in the States. We looked at actually a lot of online uh, opportunities offered to elementary schools. Uh, Jim also, my partner, Jim Mumbercat, also came in with uh, some ideas uh, from what he was dealing with because he was still employed by the Wellington Catholic District School Board. Um, and so having uh, said that, he provided with uh, us with more information. And when we approached the ministry, a couple of times they said, no, this isn't going to work. Uh, you must teach, uh, even as an online high school. And I said, well, I agree with that. Uh, I would hate to run a private school uh, unless I, we did teach, because teaching is first and foremost in our minds. Good service uh, provides a good return population and a good reputation. And it renews your license by the ministry every year. So our main drive was service, and we were wondering how to do that. And finally, when we came up with our platform, um, it was a Canadian uh, platform. It's called Desire to Learn, located in Kitchener, Waterloo. Uh, we decided to do our due diligence and investigate them to see what they were all up, uh, up involved with. And uh, the minute we told the ministry we were going with Desire to Learn as our online platform, they then knocked on our door in September of 2012, said this is the preliminary step to the uh, inspection, your first inspection as a private high school. You know, Sam, it's it's an interesting situation to have an, a completely online environment. You know, we just started our school district, and one of the things our, our administration said today is a lot of kids are getting out of our district in those last two periods because they're going home to complete their school day online taking some courses. Um, Sam, do you have a lot of students out there in California that are taking online courses? Well, when I was uh, working at a high school, some of our students would end up taking some online courses and sometimes these were credit recovery courses where they weren't able to complete, for example, their English requirement during the conventional school year. Others were enrichment experiences where I was teaching at a high school that had a hundred students at it when I joined the team. And there's some limitations to that. There's a lot of opportunity. You get to know every student's name and strengths and whatnot. But sometimes you can't offer things like AP Calculus BC, the second in the AP Calculus courses, because there's one kid every three years that wants to take it. So having an online environment like that for them to take the course in was really handy. I'm wondering, so with the Canadian Online High School, what kind of students are you serving? Are you actually delivering a full online high school curriculum to all of your students, or are you working more to supplement their brick-and-mortar curriculum? Right. Actually, that's a good question, because after we dealt with the ministry, uh, we also had to identify why we were building over two years before we got to the ministry inspection level. We started looking at our marketing, our audience, and I had to do my due diligence as an administrator by going to the ministry and finding out whether or not they would even allow us to have students far and wide. And when I say far and wide, I'm talking about internationally. Uh, we knew of a number of case studies in other provinces as well as Ontario that had uh, international students. And um, so we wanted to make sure that we were able to serve them and how we were going to serve them, whether or not there was added charge, how we could use referral agencies to get to them. So first of all, uh, to uh, make the question um, that you're asking uh, a lot more simpler, Number one, our first audience was Ontario high school students, those that were disenfranchised, bullied. As much as the school board may say there's anti-bullying, because I wrote the anti-bullying policy for the Wellington Catholic um, and assisted the Wellington public at the time uh, in their cooperative education program in trying to get a lot of those students that were bullied into the work experience where they were experiencing less of that. So that was our first target, is to identify the disenfranchised. It might have been a young lady who was pregnant. It might have been a small school uh, that maybe had only one physics course in one semester, and if a student had a major conflict with another requirement for university, then that student, in fact, could in fact, go to an online school and say, okay, I'm going to miss my one credit, I'm going to take the other, 
and uh, uh, I can take it online high school uh, at my leisure. So we cater to that audience. We also cater to the uh, student athlete. Um, we have a lot of OHL hockey players. In fact, I was the educational coordinator for the Guelph Storm, and it was a major concern to try and get students who may have come from Ottawa to Guelph and then being traded to Windsor to maintain their academic integrity. And um, we did that by setting up guidance coordinators. But with an online school, um, there is no need for that because the online school can offer wherever the student is traded, and there's no break in their teacher. There's no break in their time frame. There's, um, there's wherever they have access to the Internet, they can, they can study, and they can be taught from wherever they are. So bottom line is uh, I approached the Ontario Hockey League, David Branch and uh, his educational consultant, and the Guelph Storm, Mike Kelly, who was instrumental when I was the Guelph Storm coordinator uh, about 10 years ago. And these people here were all for it because they're saying, boy, without all these time and space and building restrictions, we now have an opportunity to offer a very viable ministry-authorized high school program for our students. And in fact, Liz Sandals, who's the Minister of Education up here, I've known her for about 30 years, uh, and she and I had a major meeting for about an hour. Prior to her becoming Minister of Education, she loved the idea and encouraged me to approach both the Upper Grand District School Board here in Guelph, as well as the Wellington Catholic, and both uh, directors also were very receptive and said, yes, please go to our schools because we all know of students who are disenfranchised, who might have cancer, uh, who might have a car accident, um, who might have family issues where they have to work and provide for the family income, disenfranchised families, uh, dysfunctional families, etc. And they said, we all know of students in our brick and mortar schools that have those needs and don't attend the brick and mortar for that reason. Um, I had an autistic child, I think it was, no, not autistic. Um, he had certain phobias. And the mother couldn't get him out of the house because when she dragged him out, he dragged the bed with her and he could not, she could not get the bed out of the front door. So we had to send packages of paper with his brother to him at his home. He did the work, he came back. He was outstanding, but he couldn't stand being out in society. He, could, he, he had a phobia of crowds. Uh, and school was that crowded phobia. But uh, he went on through the paperwork and the paper trail to try and finish off his diploma. But you can imagine what an online school would then add to his opportunities. And, you so know, that yeah, category, I, that's who we, you were targeting first. And, and that, that's really, really good that you brought that up because, you know, at least in our situation here in our school, I think of online you know, as Sam said, I want to supplement or I want to take these online courses as like the summer school to get ahead or to to further things. We do often not think about online education as, like you said, in those cases where the kid might not be able to get out of the house or might have difficulties doing things. Speaking you know, I've seen in working in private schools that oftentimes private schools that are small can be very flexible with students who have unique time demands just like the students you're describing well and it seems like your project would really make a good education accessible to a wide number of students one of the things that when I'm talking to other teachers about online education the question often comes up is what about school community so could you talk a little bit about the tools that you use to build a sense of community in an online high school? Okay, now just to address that matter, we are this year, as of November 2014, only two years old. So we're an infant compared to um, uh, being a school, being around for a while. Secondly, a lot of our students are um, in classes in singles, doubles, triplets, but we are offering a program to a Ukrainian school and to a uh, Quebec school as well as to a, um, uh, a school in India where all of the students will be enrolled in what we call synchronous learning. It's all synchronized. That means that the teacher may not necessarily be there with the students at the same time because the teacher is sleeping while the students are working. The, uh, the students are together. So our attempt in uh, the near future is to build that collegiality, to build that comfort level, to build that community. Uh, we were kidding around actually at one time when um, certain custodians heard in our brick and mortar 
uh, Wellington Catholic in the Upper Grand that we were running this, and one uh, custodian says, "Can I be your janitor of your of your school out there in the Matrix?" And everybody's seen the movie The Matrix, so um, we kidded around. We says, "Yeah, we're going to have a an online uh, football team and basketball team." But to, to make it a little more serious, in answer to your question, we're building community mainly through our classroom teachers. Um, we are looking for teachers that don't look at teaching as a job, but look at teaching as a vocation. And when there's a vocation there, the heart steps out as well as the head. And under those conditions, we've actually um, enabled a young lady to finish off her diploma because we were catering to her as an individual. Granted, she, she may not have received the full community experience of a brick-and-mortar setting, but with all due respect, once that computer goes off, she has her community. And if you notice in a brick-and-mortar school, a lot of the kids, although they will branch out to new friendships, they tend to gravitate to those that they know. So it's not like an online high school is denying them that opportunity. In fact, it might allow them to be closer to family because they're at home. It might be closer to community because they're not away from home at a private school in residence. Um, so the person-to-person -person experience is still present in all of our lives. I thought it would take me away from a lot of people involvement, but I've gotten to know more and more people on the internet and then meeting them personally and some of them I have not met, and yet on the internet I know them as well as they were a next door neighbor. So community is, is a one of perception, but I do say that um, the personal touch is very powerful. We are not there to um, diminish that. We are there to offer an opportunity in the hope that they still have that community connection in their own home, in their own city, in their own province, etc. You know, when we're talking about community, it really is about building that sense of trust and relationship between teacher and student, so that way, you know, creativity can still be alive here. Could you talk to us a little about the type of educator that you look for when you are putting courses together with teachers? What makes a good online instructor? Well, that's an interesting question, too, because I did the majority of the interviews for the first 30 staff. We have approximately 45 getting close to 50 staff now. Jim Mummerkett's now handling that end of human resources. But in terms of interviewing the teacher, my first calling was um, uh, to see whether or not it was a job or a vocation. Number two, um, to identify that as an independent contractor, they have to identify that starting small is okay. That to have one student is an entry level. Number three, we were offering, uh, I would ask them, what do you think the future will look like in teaching in 15, 20 years, depending on their age? So if I was talking to a 25-year-old, 30 years would make them 55. So I would ask them, what is education going to look like in 15 to 20 years? Are you going to be equipped for it? And a lot of them might even say, um, unfortunately, I'm not because I haven't had a whole lot of experience. So then I would say, so as an independent contractor working with COHS, we can actually assist you in professional development. Are you ready for that? Are you caught up in a certain way of teaching with uh, blinders on? Uh, or are you open to creativity? Are you open to suggestion? Are you open to change? What do you see the changes coming? What do you see your personality being in an online setting? Are you able to communicate personally, as you and I are now, Jeff and Sam? Are we able to communicate personally using technology, or is technology considered to be a barrier and suddenly I freeze up and I don't want to talk because I'm concerned about whether or not I'm being personal enough? So the opportunities are there. What are we looking for? We're looking for a teacher who is creative. We are looking for a teacher uh, who has uh, creativity in the manner in which they develop lesson plans. Uh, textbooks are sometimes very restrictive. Uh, because they are substance and material, a lot of teachers sometimes do not realize this, but they ca get caught up in that textbook groove, and the textbook becomes their Bible. As opposed to saying, <clears throat> the moment a textbook is released within a year, how many things have changed? How has the technology accelerated all the other resources that might be out there, including open resources? In fact, I saw on one online um, subscription that uh, uh, I uh, read occasionally, and it's called EdTech. And they were talking about the number of online resources being increased. 
the availability of um, opportunity to the teacher is the question I'm asking of the teacher. Are you willing to do your own research staying like a student, remaining a student while you are a teacher? Because we have to constantly learn. I've learned eons about online education and so is Jim Mumbercat and my son Justin Lenson who's in charge of social media. And so us three as the three, uh, I guess, spearheading people of this Canadian online high school along with our teachers are finding out that every day is ongoing learning. So I'm looking for that in our teachers too. We're not looking for stagnancy. We're not looking for uh, people who are caught up with issues and saying where there's a wall I, I have an impediment. My position is find a door, find a window, find the top, find the side, walk around, climb over. Let's look at alternatives. And online education allows for a lot of creativity. If you look at the Ministry of Education documents, it is amazing as to how you can meet the expectations or objectives of those course outlines using various sources. The only thing is I also ask of our teacher is not the only thing but I also ask of our teacher credibility and uh, integrity. We must make sure that we cite resources that we gather uh, information from to offer our students and we insist that our students do the same thing whether it's online, paper, or even a verbal conversation documented by date, by person, so that the resources can be properly identified. <clears throat> so we're looking for integrity, credibility in terms of resources, creativity in terms of looking at the curriculum and still meeting the ministry requirements. We're looking for a teacher who wants to be engaging with the student. They must teach, otherwise they don't belong. And last but not least, uh, as a credible teacher, we're looking for teacher qualifications. First of all, we look for the Ontario College of Teacher Qualifications because it is an Ontario curriculum. But we've got a number of teachers, uh, three or four, that are non-OCT, Ontario College of Teacher Graduates. But those people have made it their mandate to investigate what we do in the Ontario curriculum. And they've come to the forefront. So we have a lot of uh, teachers that are in that capacity and that's who we're looking for. The last but uh, other one is they've got to be social media active. Because in fact they are independent contractors, they can actually advertise their course as their own product. And advertising their own product means that they can actually post in laundromats, schools, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, any one of their courses. Let's say a student doesn't even take their course and selects another course because they discovered Canadian Online High School because of that teacher's English course. Well, like a rock thrown in a pond, there's a ripple effect, and that ripple effect hits many shores. So if that student takes a math instead of the English that the English teacher would advertise, perhaps that student's friend would say, where can I get a course or where are you taking this course online because I need a chemistry or I need an English. So long answer to your question we're looking for teachers of that nature would you say that there are some courses that are better suited for being online I mean you had mentioned chemistry um, you know not being a, a, a student of science I would think that it might be easier to take a chemistry class in a brick and mortar school where you can actually play with the stuff versus doing it in an online only environment what what are your thoughts on that should students go to you know, online only high schools for some of these courses? Well, the university and the colleges will indicate otherwise because they offer their labs as well mm -hmm. online. And uh, we have a chemistry teacher that first started with us and she's still with us. Good, loyal teacher, and an excellent teacher because she and I were exploring online uh, labs, science labs. And uh, we checked with the ministry to ensure that the practicums or the lab experiences online would be suitable. And uh, the ministry said, yes, they are. In fact, they have an independent learning center themselves that they offer various courses for. And so to say that certain courses belong online and certain courses do not, I suppose if I had to change a tire, uh, an online experience is not like me being in that shop and doing it, mm -hmm. uh, changing a carburetor or a gasket or wielding a hammer and building a frame. But I also know that many uh, courses like those science courses have online labs available. So we actually subscribed to an online lab uh, in northern New York State. And it's student fee based. 
which is very small, for an entire years of service, I think the lab was charging the student $35. So when the student is in there, they gave us, as a Canadian Online High School and our teacher, online access. So it's still firewalled and safe and secure. It's not interfered with on the social network. And uh, the student does their activities. They do forecasts. They actually can click on a bowl. They can determine how many liters go into the cylinder. They can turn the temperature up on a gauge. They can use another gauge to weigh. Uh, they can uh, use their uh, synthesizer or their centrifuge to, to whip the product around to see the sediment versus the uh, liquid fluid uh, sit. And then they can make, make their forecast. Now, the reason I say that uh, it's acceptable is because oftentimes um, we think that we have to do what business and industry require us to do. Um, a good example is cooperative education when I was doing that. And it reminds me of Canadian Online High School. And we said to a, an auto company here in Guelph, we said, well, we're going to teach them this about automobiles, that and that. And they're going to use this lathe and they're going to clean off those brakes and, and uh, fix up those springs and the automotive person said the schools financially cannot keep up with business and industry. You cannot put in a lathe in your school that equals our lathes. You cannot do their tire rotation machines and mechanical machines the way we do ours. So he said teach the students to learn the basics, teach them to love learning and when they come to the employer leave the rest to us, almost like a cooperative education experience. So an online high school does not um, even think that it can replace live active sessions. But that doesn't mean that we discredit ourselves with the courses we offer. We offer the experiences that allows the student to say, do I really like doing this? And maybe we're saving a lot of money and time by allowing them to enter that virtual environment um, and uh, then they can decide if they want to pursue that further, then they can perhaps do that after their high school or in a summer job, maybe give it that physical trial. So to say that one is better than the other, to be honest with you, there is no answer. Each student will give you their answer or his and her. But to answer it empirically, I don't think we can do that. All we're trying to do is offer the credit courses that the students that are gravitating to online high school would like to have offered as an alternative. We're sitting here talking to Will Lenson from the Canadian Online High School. Of course, we can find out more information at Canadian high, Online. Say that one more time. CanadianOnlineHighSchool.com. Well, what can we expect to find when we go there? Is this something that a student can come and sign up with, or do they need to get the backing of a school district, maybe for financial s situations? How does a student or a family sign their kid up for Canadian Online High School? Okay, that's a multifaceted question. I love those, but keep me on track if I waver. Um, first of all, when a student takes an online course with us, they do not have to get a school's permission, and they don't have to get the school board permission. <clears throat> because we are authorized by the Ministry of Education, we can be uh, the school for their evening studies. Uh, when we do, however, finish a course, we must indicate to that school and by the way when a school registered or a student registers we like to let the school know that the school student is in so that school then knows that the student of theirs as a home school is with us secondly we send them the report cards and that report card and mark then goes on their transcript because it's only the home school that holds that transcript if we are not the home school we do not hold the transcript the student then can go onto our uh, website. We have a student handbook there. In fact, inside the handbook it says, click here to see whether or not your computer can handle the desire to learn software and the programs that we have to offer. If everything is validated, that means that the student's computer is capable. We can also provide that for iPads and for um, mobile phones that have data plans. Then when the student goes there and checks out our handbook, even if they're not from our province, we can grant them any credits from another province or another uh, country, what they call EQV or equivalency credits, so that their previous school times are not wasted. We then recommend courses that they can take. 
and they then go to the course area or go to the registration area, click there, fill out a registration form. We are secure payment format by using PayPal and uh, it's encrypted and they can use credit card. We've had some people actually mail a check to the school's home address which is 14 Sharon Place here in Guelph, Ontario. So we will take the paper check, the, uh, the credit card format, e-transfer is fine as well. And so as a student then registers, they provide us with their academic records, a recent photo, and a form of identification which could be a passport, birth certificate, um, or driver's license. And those are mandated by the Ministry of Education. So if they came to inspect us, they'd say, show us these items from this student. Show us the prerequisites or the equivalents that allow them to take this course. Show us the report card. So the student then registers with us by way of the internet, online, but they can also do it in a traditional fashion if they wish. And, you know, one of the things that you also mentioned was that people can reach out to you on social media. Where do we find out more information about Canadian high, online high school um, on your social media channels? Okay. Um, those social media channels are visible on our website, actually. My son, Justin Lenson, is our social media coordinator. He's graduated from, uh, um, uh, from uh, the film industry, animation, as well as uh, worked for Apple for many years. And he has become our social media person. And so when you go onto our website and click onto any one of those social media icons, uh, you'll get directly attached to our social media, which includes everything from Facebook to YouTube to Twitter. Um, and uh, those are the predominant ones, of course. And we have a number of others as well. Uh, Pinterest is another that uh, Justin has, uh, has utilized for us. So those connections I do not have up here because we obviously like to divvy our responsibilities being a small crowd. So Justin has those on the website. And if you wish to connect with us that way, we can do so. Uh, we've connected with you, uh, Jeff, on TeacherCast because we're very interested in uh, communicating, sharing, learning, and seeing where the Internet goes. And yours is a very unique version uh, that we were excited about, just as excited as we were about our own high school opportunities. So there's very few and far between in your area as there are in offering online education. And I would emphasize this, high school online education. It's prevalent in post-secondary, but in high school, there's a massive void. We have uh, one gentleman, just to share a story with you, uh, who uh, came to us from Vancouver, actually. He... Um, he was born in India. He worked for the Indian um, uh, Naval Group, was in charge of three warships, came to Canada, landed in Vancouver, started an international timber industry, started a confederation, I think it's called Confederation College, but um, it, it was a, a Vancouver college that offered uh, not diplomas, not degrees, but certification in things like first aid, in the use of Excel or the use of Word. For a lot of immigrants that are coming from the Pacific shorelines into Vancouver and he was servicing their needs. Uh, placed a lot of people in employment full time but he also found there was something missing and it was the secondary opportunity of their uh, students coming in from overseas. So he went from all the way from British Columbia through Alberta through the Prairie Provinces ended up on Ontario and found us. Within a week he was in Toronto we spent 10 hours at a meeting he went back and within two weeks we were already uh, using him as a referral agency for uh, India and China and those areas. A second person came to us from Mississauga in the same fashion. He was dealing with a lot of students coming into the private schools. Uh, uh, there are a number of private schools in the Toronto area that are quite renowned. And so when he was uh, dealing with uh, students overseas and bringing them over, he was dealing with students who were saying to them in the overseas countries, we would love to come, but we can't afford it. We'd love to come to a private school. We'd love to get Ontario education because we'd like to venture into Canada or even Ontario uh, for the universities. But we can't afford to come to a private high school or a public one for that matter. So then he figured maybe we should try and find an online high school. But he found us. He's now established... Uh, centers uh, in the area of Nigeria, he's exploring Colombia, Mexico, and Hong Kong. And a third lady who's a lawyer in Toronto said, 
we have some Ukrainian students and uh, and people in Georgia and and other countries in that uh, area like Azerbaijan that also would have a like like to have the similar opportunity but they aren't wealthy and they can't afford the big bill of coming over can you help us and I said so you're trying to build a business around our business she said indeed and she's a lawyer immigration lawyer so we've established a relationship with them as well so we are looking at expanding and we're looking at offering students in Quebec for example that do not want to go to two years of CEGEP and they want to go from grade 11 into grade 12 into university rather than grade 11 into CEGEP, the Quebec program of two years, and then into university. So we're there for a lot of different people. I was talking to a First Nations group north of uh, Thunder Bay. And if you notice in the news recently, uh, the Canadian government is looking at enhancing opportunities for education. And I talked to two chiefs online, actually, in Skype about their opportunities and they said we're quite limited because we're in such isolated communities our internet isn't working that well and I said make that your educational agenda she said what do you mean I said if you have a high flying fast internet Canadian online high school can be that quick in the schools of your students and on site on your native lands and in fact we've got one teacher in British Columbia that presently is building our First Nations Aboriginal courses that the Ministry of Education of Ontario has also mandated as acceptable. So instead of studying French, those students can study Cree. So we're starting to discover all kinds of opportunities that are out there. Uh, I indicated my answer would be hopefully short, but our students are coming from far and wide and they register directly or in the old-fashioned way and we're also catering to the back-to-work people, people that are unemployed, that have to pick up their high school marks and maybe change career because their company closed down, shut down, or changed, and they weren't ready for those changes. Well, it certainly seems like there's a bright future for online education, specifically high school online education. And if you are out there listening and you are interested in enrolling your students into something like this, I highly recommend. Check it out. The website, again, is Canadian online high school education and of course we're going to have all the links to this wonderful organization including their social links up on our website this is of course tech uh teacher cast podcast 108 will thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for coming on and good luck as you guys move into the future especially expanding into those international markets will thank you again for your time Thank you very much, and www.canadiananlinehighschool.com welcomes you at any time. We're open 24-7, 365. Well, my friends, that wraps up the 108th episode of the TeacherCast podcast. I want to thank again Sam Patterson for coming on and talking to us all about the Edu Puppets, and of course, Will Lenson from the Canadian Online High School, telling us all about some of the great online learning opportunities for your high school students. There's, of course, many ways to reach out and connect with us here at TeacherCast. You can leave us a voice message at teachercast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at teachercast.net. Find us on Twitter at TeacherCast, and of course, subscribe to our many audio and video channels at TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and TeacherCast.net slash YouTube. Thank you so much today for allowing TeacherCast to be a part of your professional development network, and I hope you take a moment to share TeacherCast with your PLN as we start this school year. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Please join me each and every Sunday night on TeacherCast.tv for the Tech Educator Podcast, your weekly webinar. Until next time, keep up the great work in your class and continue sharing your passions with your students.